Hello and welcome to One to Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad. Each episode we pick an area of agriculture or food production to discuss. And this week we are talking about house plants. <laughs> What do you know about the humble house plant, Dad? Why would anyone want to live inside of a plant? Oh, brother. As their house. Oh, God. Their house. Oh, no. It's, um, uh... <laughs> I know that they are plants that you can put inside of your house. I suppose they're usually in some sort of receptacle like a pot. You have to occasionally water them. That's what I know. Pretty good. Oh, really? Show over? We're done? That's the whole show. That's all we wanted to say. <laughs> okay. No, not really. All right. So when talking about the beginning of the houseplant, uh, which is where I want to start this episode, a lot of people talk about the hanging gardens of Babylon, ancient China, ancient Egypt. They had plants and they were inside. Uh, people have had plants on the inside for a long time, but it didn't really become trendy in like modern times until really Victorian England when it kind of became a fixture of, of the middle class household, um, at least here in the in the West. Wow. I thought you were going to say something like the original cavemen had lichen on their walls. I mean, they did. That's true. <laughs> All right. One of the most famous like old school house plants uh, from this like Victorian period is cast iron plants. And there's actually a really good episode of the house plant podcast on the ledge with Jane Perrone. Uh, it's episode 138 and they only talk about cast iron plants and it's extremely fascinating. Okay. What in the world is a cast iron plant? Is it a plant that you put in cast iron or grow on cast iron or is made of cast iron? I don't know. It is none of those things. It's also called an aspidistra. Uh, they're called cast iron plants because they just, like, they're tough. They're really tough, like cast iron would be. Okay. They're tough to eat or tough to kill or... Tough to kill. Yeah, All like right. they're sturdy. That's kind of how they got the name is, is they're just super sturdy. Um, but aspidistra is kind of the, the nicer name. Cast iron plant kind of now has a bad connotation because it's, like it's like an old school plant. It's like passe, but if you say aspidistra, like, oh, that sounds so nice. But cast iron plant's kind of old school. All right, cool. But this episode of On the Ledge, which also, can I say, is a very great name for a podcast about houseplants, is terrific. You should check it out. Do people put houseplants on ledges? Yeah, like on the, the ledge of like a a window or okay. like a counter. Yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. that. I like that. That's that's great. I love that name. In 1960s, houseplants really kind of got kicked up in terms of like a design feature. Before that, it was, you know, mostly just, oh, yes, a nice plant and they're good for me, question um, mark. But in the 1960s, it was really like considered a part of the design as as we moved into this kind of mid-century modern era of interior design. Uh, house plants and like particularly different tropical plants really became big features of rooms. This kind of diminished as you moved into the 1980s, particularly for like houses. It, it became more popular to have uh, like a fake plant. But uh, in mall gardens, actually, I was doing research for this episode and like particularly like the mall garden be was like something that was called out as like the first public space that had a larger planting more than just like a pot. You remember like here in Austin at Barton Creek Mall, there's like a big garden over by one of the fountains. That's pretty common. And that being that like large indoor planting was the first time we really saw it in the 1980s in malls. I got to be honest with you. I don't know that I ever actually noticed. I noticed the fountains, but I don't know that I noticed the plants, maybe like some Big leaves or something. I never really thought about that. Interesting. Yeah. A garden inside of a mall. Not just an outdoor shopping mall, but an indoor shopping mall. An indoor shopping mall. What a concept. Okay. Is it like a big greenhouse with this sky roof, sunroof, translucent I, roof? 
I mean, it's just like, you know, on the ground floor, you got a fountain and you got plants around the fountain. Okay. And I guess the fluorescent lights are enough for them. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of malls also have skylights and stuff like that. So. Okay. Yeah, indoor plants really don't need a lot of light. So it, ah. it works. Yeah. Today, a lot of houseplants are popular, uh, particularly because a lot of people are renting. Um, and it's really easy to fill your house with houseplants uh, as kind of a way to make it feel homey, but without having to make any permanent changes to the structure, like, you know, painting or wallpapering or putting up shelves or something like that. Um, yeah, they're just super on trend now. So I wanted to talk about them. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like they sort of became popular in Victoria, England, and then all of a sudden, you know, a few decades later, it was akin to picking out furniture. Uh, you yeah. also had to pick out some house plants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of reasons for that are mostly around the advancement of the industry and the advancement of like greenhouse technology. It's become much easier to find those tropical plants that You know, maybe we just couldn't find them in the 1920s and 1930s because we didn't have ways to transport them and carry them. And that industry really hadn't developed. Whereas now you can find them at every single supermarket, at every single hardware store. Like they're just super common uh, because that industry has really developed and we have ways to transport them and care for them and all that. Is it true they do better if you play music for them? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we could do a whole episode on playing music for your plants. Okay. That'd be cool. So... What are the reasons that we keep houseplants? So number one, we've been talking about it. It adds to the aesthetic nature of a space, for sure. I found a lovely Architectural Digest article that particularly talked about feng shui, which of course is an ancient Chinese method of creating like a balanced energy in a space. And they offered like some suggestions of, you know, different things that you might want to do in your house both in terms of design and in terms of more utilitarian things. So, for example, if you wanted to give your space a sense of grounding or softness, they recommended philodendron or jade. If you wanted to heighten the the space, they recommended ficus or rubber plant or a banana leaf plant, all of which are quite tall. Um, If you wanted to balance excess water, kind of a more utilitarian need, like somewhere in a bathroom or a laundry room, they recommended like an air plant or perhaps a pothos which you're familiar with. These are all great plants and great uses for them. I'm going to talk a little bit later about all different options um, for some of my favorite plants and why they're helpful. But yeah, like they they provide a really lovely aesthetic thing in your house. Uh, It's really soft. They're really lovely. And it's a very different shape than most of our furniture nowadays. So they're great. Nice. Plants can also clean the air. Uh, to what benefit it's questionable, and I'll talk about that. But they can also for sure increase the humidity of the space. Um, if you have a dry room, particularly like if it's wintertime or you live in somewhere like the desert, having plants in your house is definitely going to increase the humidity of the space just because you're watering them more frequently. Um, and then, you know, there's water in their trays sometimes and not all the water is going directly into the plants. So having water out is going to be increasing the humidity. I can definitely see in the winter, July in Central Texas, maybe we don't need the humidity quite so much, but... We don't need the humidity here, but I definitely lived in places where I'm like, oh, it's so nice. I come home, there's a bit of moisture in the air as I'm parched, you know, from coming in from the desert, the desert sun. Got it. There was a NASA experiment that was published in 1989 that was investigating ways to like effectively detoxify space station air. And they found that in a lab environment... Indoor plants can scrub the air of volatile compounds like formaldehyde and benzene, which are things that we don't want in our air. Yeah. Uh, However, you know, if you really have a medical need for air purification, don't replace your air purifier, which is plants. Plants are doing this, but not on a huge level. I mean, they're they're very small guys. They they can only do so much. You can't put like a whole rainforest in your bathroom. Yeah. I mean, they're lovely to have. But if you need air purification, maybe have both. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, they, they do do this. But in a outside of a laboratory setting, it was a, a really remarkable difference. Okay. Okay. I want you to imagine a scenario for me. Okay? All right. I've got my brain camera turned on. Okay. So you're sitting in a room. Sitting in a room. 
There are no windows. Why? There, are, the chair you're sitting in is really hard. It's kind of uncomfortable. Am I in prison? Uh, sure. If you want to be in prison, I don't you can imagine in yourself in prison. I'm in a really hard chair with no in a room with no windows. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the light overhead is kind of bright. It's like fluorescent. The ground under your feet. Uh, it's like a reflective tile, so it's kind of, you know, there's light reflecting back up at you, and all the walls are like a bright white. This seriously How'd... sounds like the intro to a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel, right? Yeah, no, it's awful. Not good. Okay, now imagine the same room, but there's a really big rubber tree plant or ficus plant in the corner of the room. How does that change things? I guess it it creates one point of interest. Yeah? Yeah. How do you think your your physical reaction would change to that room? Would you feel I don't know, more stressed, less stressed? I would no feel change? I would feel less stressed except if I walked into that room in the first description I would be like, "Oh, this is a really weird, cold, creepy room." In the second description I'd be like, "Oh, this is a really weird, cold, creepy room." But look, there's a plant over there. That's kind of weird. Why did someone put a plant in the corner? <laughs> Yeah, okay, that, sure. It's a, not a perfect but description. I, I see what you're saying. You know, it's it's the cold, creepy room versus the cold, creepy room with, like, a little life in it. That, yeah. That, you know, adds adds that little something extra. Yeah, there have definitely been, been studies that have shown that plants in a space can improve your mood, improve your concentration, improve health outcomes. Uh I found this piece from a Psychology Today article that said, based on several experimental studies, the presence of potted plants have been found to be helpful in many different settings, including work, school, and hospitals. Particularly, they have been shown to lower blood pressure, improve reaction times, increase attentiveness, improve attendance at work and school, raise productivity at work, improve well-being, improve perceptions of the space, which is a really vague term. I don't know how you measure that, but cool. Uh, lower levels of anxiety after you're re- when you're recovering from surgery and raise job satisfaction, which is like a lot that we're asking from just these little plants. No kidding. I almost feel like this is a superfoods episode and, and we should put a cape on a houseplant. <laughs> I had a professor in college who's actually studying uh, the impact of plants in a classroom on like college quiz test grades um, and like the, the correlation there. It's great to have plants in a room. They make you feel more relaxed. And being inside of a angular, stuffy, cold room is not natural for our brains. Uh, it's not where our brains are at, you know, peak operation. It's weird. Uh, and so having a little bit of that nature, it seems, can help de-stress us and and can help us feel more relaxed, can help us enjoy a space more, which can then, I'm assuming, correlate to to this like improved attendance. If you like the space more, you're probably more likely to go to a space versus if you really hate the space. Okay, cool. Magic plants. I mean, is it magic? Is it brain science? Who can say? Fair enough. But you know what we can say? What's that? We can say that we're going into a break right now. Oh, here we go. Hey, Hallie. Hey, Dad. Do you know who probably has houseplants? Who? Our Starfruit patrons. Vikram, Lindsay, Mama Casey, Patrick. Patrick and Cheyenne. And Cheyenne. You guys are so wonderful and your support means the world to us. If you at home listening are interested in joining our Patreon family, it helps so much. It makes so many things possible for the show, including us to have series. We've got transcripts on the website now, which our patrons are paying for 100%. Uh, you have supported so many things about the show, and we are so, so grateful. If you are interested in supporting the show, you can head over to patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. We have a lot of different super fun tiers. Yeah, uh, tiers that get you bonus content like uh, outtakes and little extra audios. Uh, we got the Plant of the Month Club. We send you a little digital file with some plant facts about certain plants and a recipe using that plant. And sometimes we'll mail you a postcard, but we haven't recently because I have been a little afraid to go to Office Depot to get it printed out and go to the post office to mail it out. Don't want to do that because there's a plague on, but we will get those mailed out someday. And our Starfruit patrons get all kinds of goodies like boxes of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We've been doing like goodie boxes for Starfruit patrons. We just did the first one 
I guess back in June. Yeah, June is when they got delivered. Uh, and we worked with a really cool artist in Australia. And she mailed them soaps and handmade candles and handmade lip balms and a bunch of really cool stuff. Uh, the next one is going to be closer to November, December. We're doing it about twice a year. So we'll be talking about it again when we get closer to that. But if you're interested in supporting the show at any tiers, any levels, you can do $1. You can do more than that. We would really appreciate the support. Um, if the show is something that is meaningful to you, it's, it's great. We have so much fun over there. You also get like a discord channel and we can chat. Gosh, I feel like this mid roll is not going well. <laughs> it's going super long. You know what I would appreciate if we got What's back to that? the episode. Oh, my God. Okay. Dad, you got a nature fact for us? I do have a nature fact. Hit me. All right. So, in the beginning of the episode, I asked, who would want to live in a plant anyway? Mm Mm-hmm. Because it's hilarious, right? Sure. Well, you know who does live in plants is the Keebler elves. They live in a tree. Yep. They do. And you know who it turns out is a subsidiary of Keebler? Who? Little Brownie Baker. Okay. <laughs> they are one of the bakers that make Girl Scout cookies. Yeah, I know so this. So for half of the country, Keebler makes Girl Scout cookies. Not only that, but Keebler has their own cookies that are the same flavors as some of the Girl Scout cookies, like Thin Mints and Samoas. They're just uh-huh. not as exciting to buy from Keebler as they are from Girl Scouts. Right. This blew my mind. Is this? Did you already know all this? <laughs> it's not blowing your mind? I was a Girl Scout. I knew this. Wait, you knew? So I feel like you were in on something. I was in on something? Like a conspiracy? Yeah. We don't have Little Brownie here. (laughs) We don't have Little Brownie in Texas. We've got ABC. So it's like a totally different distributor. So even if I bought the the Keebler Thin Mints, they wouldn't be the same as the Girl Scout Thin Mints that we get here. I mean, it's like the same formula. I don't know how different it is bakery to bakery. I've never done a a test comparison. All right. Well, I don't know. I feel like I'm giving some pretty significant information to the rest of the world. So you can be like, yeah, I knew that, whatever. But I bet, I bet, listener, I bet there's at least one of you out there that did know that already. Congratulations to the rest of our listenership other than me uh, on now finding out that you can buy Thin Mints all year round. But it does not go to support Girl Scouts, which is really great for the development of leadership skills in young women. So support Girl Scouts. True. Oh, wait, I have to do the theme. Oh, yeah, you got to do the theme. Don't forget to do the theme. Da-da-da-da-da-da, nature fact. Nature fact. So let's say I've gotten really excited about the idea of getting a houseplant after you told me about all this great stuff. I hope so. What do I need to do other than purchase it? What do houseplants need? Yeah, I want to put it in the corner of the room that I use for my office. Okay. Plants need light and water and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Okay, so I can definitely supply carbon dioxide. Great. I would probably have to remember to give it water. How often would I need to give it water? I guess it probably depends on the plant. Correct. You say it needs light. Is the light from my overhead enough? Probably. Probably, but, really. But okay. maybe not. But yeah. maybe not. So maybe if there's a window in there, that's a good thing. But maybe the light is good enough. So, But I have no idea how to get it nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. Do I give it bananas? Uh, I wouldn't. No. no. Personally, okay. would not do that at all. Uh, if you plant it in potting soil, it has a lot of nutrients in it. If you plant it with compost, then that improves the nutrition as well. Uh, but also, you will probably want to have some kind of liquid fertilizer. Eventually, it will need it. Uh, there are different options. There are mineral versions. There are organic versions. You can just go to your local nursery and say, hey, I have this plant. What do you recommend? And they have a, a myriad of options. Uh, you can buy it at, at a large hardware store like a big box. But I always recommend shopping local because they typically uh, have a wider selection and they will also have great knowledge on what would do best for your houseplants. So wait, if I have, say, a slightly bigger houseplant that I have to put on the floor, maybe it's a, a ficus or something that, you know, takes up a large area of a mm-hmm. pot, can I 
put my composting material directly on top of that and just have it compost on top of the plant soil and then sort of mix it in over time. Yeah, you can top dress with compost. Really? Uh, but yeah, you can also just mix it in when you're potting it up if you'd like. And that typically helps the bacteria and the fungi and, you know, whatever else is living in your compost to just disperse. I mean, they're very small little guys. So if you put them on the top, it's going to take them a long time to get down to the bottom. So if you mix them in your own self, then it just helps them get around to all the different parts of your plant. But if your pot's already planted, you don't want to repot it, you can totally just top dress with compost. Okay, that makes sense. So I wanted to talk about some of my favorite plants uh, and specifically like outlining what they need, what they're good for. Uh, and then after that, I was going to talk about some of the common issues and some of the best practices uh, for having houseplants. Lay it on me. So number one, pothos ivy. You know this plant. It's what your houseplant Gary was. Uh, doesn't need full sun. Very expressive. They They really let you know when something's going on. Not all plants do that. Uh, really easy to propagate, easy to grow in water. Uh, they're great. They're great. Actually, it's Jerry. Okay. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> Actually, it's Jerry. Terry. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I, I feel like though, and I feel like I'm cutting you off a little bit here. I feel like there was a point where the little jar of water that I was growing him in wasn't good enough anymore and I needed to do something else with them, like move them to mm -hmm. a different container or to some dirt or something. Does that make sense? Should I have done something with them? Yeah. So pothos ivy can grow 100% hydroponically. Um, Austin has hardish water. So usually there's, there's a good amount of nutrition in the water itself. But if you want the plant to continue creating new leaves um, and, and growing as opposed to just growing small amounts and then shedding the old leaves, um, so really increasing the, the amount of leaves and, and the, the size of the plant, then you probably will have to add additional nutrition into the water just so that it can fill all themselves up, you know? But you don't like move it to a bigger container or anything like that? I don't know. I mean, you might eventually need to do that uh, just based on gravity mostly, like physics. If like, okay. physically it's not holding up, then yeah. Uh, but you can have like a, a tall plant with a small root ball in a small container, but you just have to make sure that it's getting the nutrition and the water it needs without burning it. So if you had a lot of leaves in a small small root area, you would have to water it probably more frequently with a low dilution because otherwise uh, it wouldn't be getting enough nutrition and you would you could have the potential of burning the leaves if you added more nutrition, uh, like increase the dilution of it. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Uh, next, rosemary. Uh, rosemary does need full sun, so you got to have one of the big windows for it, but it does not need a lot of water. Also smells very nice, and it will flower, and you can also eat it, which is a bonus. Goes great on chicken. Three, peace lily. Uh, I was informed one time by someone who worked at a florist shop that this is a plant that you get people when they know someone who has died as like a condolence plant, but it's not just that. But just so you know, they might make a comment when you try and buy it. Uh, it does not need direct sun. It's one of the best plants for low light. Uh, it's a really, really good office plant because it's nice and big, uh, but it grows really slowly and it doesn't get super tall. So it's it's super manageable. And it has nice flowers. Flowers are great. Love a flower. Number four is the bromeliad. Uh, the flowers on this one have super nice color. Depending on what you get, you can get a pink, a yellow, an orange, a red. Um, they do need high drainage and they can tolerate high sun, but they're super lovely. The fifth one is a diffenbachia. These are good for small plants, um, but they can also get really big, which is super nice. They do need good drainage, but they're also super good for low light. Cool. Lots of options. Lots of options. Those are my faves. There's a billion, jillion houseplants, so you don't have to get one of these. Please send us pictures of your houseplants on Twitter, even if they're not one of these six plants, but especially if they are, please send pictures. Five plants. You talked about five plants. One, two, three, four, five. I talked about five plants. <laughs> okay, so next I was going to talk about some of the common issues uh, with plants, houseplants. You can get some pest problems. Some of the most common pests are whitefly, spider mites, scale. The most common 
time to get a pest for your houseplant is when you buy a new plant and it's already infected. You can have one of your existing plants get infected with a pest, but it's it's just not as likely because the, the pest has to be introduced somehow and it's your house. Uh, so you're usually not bringing spider mites in to your own house other than on a plant. So when you buy a plant, this is another reason to to be really critical um, when buying your plant, thinking through where you're buying it from. Do you trust them? Are you sure it's clean? Inspecting plants before you bring them home. Uh, I oftentimes, if I buy a new plant, I'll keep it away from my older plants, like my existing plants in the house, just to make sure I don't see any symptoms or issues uh, before introducing it to the rest of the house. Okay. Do they follow you home? Do what? Wait, what do you mean? Spider mites. Like maybe you're walking home from work and the spider mites say, oh, I bet he has a nice house plant. And they just... Oh, <laughs> probably not. No. Okay. Uh, if you have, if you get an infestation in your plants, um, just start by pinching off as many of the insects as you see. That might be able to curb the infestation before it like really takes off. But if it kind of takes off, you want to separate the infested plants from those that are not infested. Uh, and you just have to research treatment methods based on what the infestation is. It depends based on pest. Sorry, I can't give more specific advice. I was going to say, if the pest is new to you, you probably have to research what even the pest is before you research yeah. the treatment method. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. Other issues you can get, disease. Um, typically, it's a fungus. Sometimes it's a bacteria that will affect a houseplant. Uh, similar to pests, the most frequent time to get this is with a new plant. Similar to pests, you'll want to you know, cordon off the infected plant. There are several common diseases that can plague houseplants. Uh, one of them is powdery mildew, which can really easily be treated by spraying a solution of water and baking soda onto, your, onto the leaves of the plant. If you get a fungus in your potting soil, you just have to replant the plant in brand new soil, toss out the old stuff. But also, if you see mushrooms in your houseplants, don't worry about it. It's probably just compost mycelia that is now fruiting. So it's fine. Are they talking to the plant? Yeah, they're probably talking to the plant. It's great to have fun fungi in your soil. But if it's like a if it's like a fungal infection, if it's causing issues, then repot. Just shake off as much of the soil from the roots as you can. Try to get it really clean and then repot. All right. If your plant is wilting, yellowing, showing general signs of poor health, uh, then it's it could be being watered incorrectly. Uh, both overwatering and underwatering can show similar stress signs, which can be frustrating. However, you probably know how much you're watering it. So if you think you're watering it too much, water it less. If you think you're not watering enough, then water it more. Both cases of over and under watering, it's because the roots aren't functioning properly. They're not able to take up water. If you're underwatering it, then the water's just not there. So the, the roots begin to die off and they're not able to take that water up. But if you're overwatering it, then the roots become anaerobic. They, they don't have enough oxygen. And so the roots begin to die off and they can't take up water. So that's why it looks similar. Um, but usually if you have root rot, if, if your, you know, roots are becoming anaerobic, it's being overwatered, then you can just feel the, the soil. And if it's still wet, then it just really needs to dry off. You might need to pull your plant out and repot it. But usually just changing the watering regime is, is good enough. You can also have incorrect light. So if your plant is yellowing, it's not getting enough sun. Uh, if it's being scorched, if it looks like it's being burned, like there's there's brown spots on the leaves, then it might be getting too much sun. All right. So that's a run through of like issues. Uh, some of the best practices to avoid these issues, always consider your environment when deciding which plant to get. We talked about this in the vegetable gardening episode as well. Uh, don't get a full sun plant. If you're planning on putting it under a fluorescent light, don't get a partial sun plant and put it next to a window. It will get scorched. Um, consider how often you want to be watering your plants. Think about your own preferences uh, with, with how you want to be interacting with your plants. Always plant it correctly. You want to make sure that your root ball is higher up in the pot. Uh, this is one of the main mistakes that I see people make with houseplants is they plant the root ball too low and then it's hard to get oxygen into the root ball zone. Uh, so make sure it's planted nice and high up in the pot. So the root ball, I guess, is just 
the roots of the plant. Mm -hmm. And if it's too low, it can't get oxygen, Mm -hmm. which sounds weird. I don't understand why that is. Well, I mean, we've talked about soil in the past. Potting soil is different from ground soil, obviously, but potting soil still has a lot of oxygen in the roots. Um, The soil in the ground is like 50% pore space usually. Okay. So potting soil usually has a little bit more than that, but our plants are are used to growing in soil in the ground, and so they, they need that pore space. Uh, and usually it'll get filled up with water, and then the water will drain quickly, and then it will get filled up with air again. Um, and if you don't have air in your root zone, uh, then you get like I was talking about earlier, you can get anaerobic conditions with your roots. Got it. Um, so if they're not getting enough water, then the roots can begin to rot. You can begin to have fungal issues. You need to have some kind of air movement, which does not seem intuitive. It's true, but it's still important for good plant health. The exception is if you're growing something hydroponically. Obviously, it's already anaerobic, but it's a different situation. Make sure you're always using high quality compost and or good potting soil or core or whatever you're using. Uh, if you're planting in a jar or a mug or a cup or something without drainage, you you can do that, but you will need to repot the plant regularly, at least once a year. If you plant in a pot, uh, you might start to see like a white crust appear on the top of your potting soil. That's salts building up from your tap water. Uh, it, tap water is not purified. If you if you water your plants with like 100% purified bottled water, then you won't see that, but it's a waste. Um, it's fine. It's not hurting the plant, but it can become unsightly. So it can be a good practice to to repot one, once in a while when after you start to see that, that salt buildup. And you keep talking about repotting. Mm-hmm. Um, is this like an as-needed thing or should you repot periodically? You were talking about, I guess, the, you know, mugs and cups and jar plants, you know, repot at least once a year. Uh, I guess is a good guideline. Yeah, other than that, it's as needed. Okay. Honestly, like you can have plants in the same pot for decades and they can do fine. One trick if you're dealing with bigger plants, um, it can be easier to leave them in like the plastic pots that you get at like the store. Uh, just because if you need to, if you need to repot them, you can really easily like cut those pots out. Um, so if you just take that like flimsy plastic pot uh, and put it whole hog into like a, a nicer looking planter, uh, but not actually replant it into the planter. Those planters can be super heavy. So if a bigger plant needs to be repotted and it's like planted into the planter, it can just be a real pain to to get that done. So that's like the main, one of the main issues I think with re- repotting is if they're really big. Um, so it might just be easier to do that. Okay. But yeah, other than that, it's just as needed. There's not always a, a like a regime. Some plants need more maintenance um, in repotting, but it's got to be a, like a plant by plant rule. Like there's not kind of a, a rule of thumb that you can go by. Not even a green thumb. Not even a, a rule of green thumb. Green rule of thumb. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's like. That's like pretty much it for tropical houseplants. I also included a little bit at the end. If you want to be doing like food crops indoors, pretty much always they will need a lot more light. So you can buy grow lights. Uh, You can just use any fluorescent or LED bulb. uh, And usually it says like how many lumens they are. And there's really helpful resources online for like knowing how bright you want a a light to be a grow light. I would say... uh, I would opt for LED if you're between fluorescent and LED because fluorescents can get really hot, uh, which unless you're growing something like, I don't know, peppers or tomatoes or something, uh, they probably won't want, especially if your plants are growing up and they might end up touching the bulbs. That can be really damaging to the leaves if they end up touching like a hot fluorescent bulb. Uh, But yeah, you can grow whatever you want inside. Why not? All right. So grow something. Uh, It sounds... I mean, there's some maintenance, but it sounds pretty easy, and it'll make you a happier, better person in the end. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. This show is made by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free. If you'd like to connect with us, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at One to Grow On Pod. 
or join our Discord and Facebook communities and leave us your thoughts on this episode. You can find all of our episodes and transcripts as well as information about the team and the show on our website, onetogrowonpod.com. Help us take root and grow organically by recommending the show to your friends or consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash onetogrowonpod. There, you can get access to audio extras, fascinating follow-ups, exclusive bonus content, and boxes of our favorite goodies. If you like the show, please share it with a friend. Sharing is the best way to help us reach more ears. Be sure to see what's sprouting in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing.